So what I'd like to do now is invite uh, three of our panelists to, to join me on stage. Uh, if we can have Dr. Jess, Shaka Singh Gore, and the man himself, Big Sean, join me on stage, please. Where we sitting at, so bro? Of course. Yep, anywhere you want to come. Uh, leave the last seat open. Yeah. Absolutely. There we go. Thank you. So Dr. Jess is a new uh, NYU trained psychiatrist, has recently been recognized by Forbes as a leader in making mental health and wellness a part of the current zeitgeist. Yeah. She was educating me on that word. I was like, what is this <laughs> word? She said zeitgeist. I'm going to make it hot. So, uh, <laughs> so zeitgeist. Um, and, and overall, what she's doing I think is amazing. She's young, she's beautiful, she's African American, she's bringing awareness to, to an issue that is extremely taboo. And uh, you've probably heard her on The Breakfast Club, she's definitely changing the game in, in the conversation. So please help me uh, welcome Dr. Jess. Hi guys, that's my new favorite word, hi guys. Um, Shaka Senghor, so for those who don't know Shaka's story, I've known Shaka since I've been here and just an amazing, amazing man. Um, you know, ultimately, a uh, few years ago, a number of years ago, he uh, killed a man. And uh, he did 20 plus years in prison, many of those in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't let his worst deed define who he was for life. And, uh, and so when you talk about mental toughness, mental health, we'll, we'll get into a conversation about what actually led up to that murder, right, of not dealing with certain things. But then more importantly, how did he overcome uh, you know, that stigma? Uh, how did he overcome the self-doubt, the self-hatred that he must have felt? And so his huh. voice around incarceration is, is truly important. So make some noise for Shaka Singh. Oh. <laughs> now, of course, the man, the myth, the legend, Big Sean, uh, look, he, he puts on for the city every, every, yeah, every day. And, yeah, uh, you know, what he's doing around this conversation, elevating this conversation, is amazing. And, uh, and so I'm really, I've had a chance to talk to him about, about this conversation for a couple years now, uh, last year most recently, so really looking forward to digging into his evolution uh, on this topic. So make some noise for Big Sean. And then please help me one more time, give a lot of love to Puma and Vivian Ramirez for making all of this possible. And, and one last uh, big ups to uh, my BFF. I like that. That's a new term. My, my BFF, Myra Anderson. Like, she is the rock of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. So, so let's just start off. What I want to do is kind of set the, set the stage on where we are as a country right now, ask you guys a few questions around that. We do have some visual artists over there. Uh, because although we want to have a conversation, it's most important that what we leave here with is a blueprint of things that we can all do to, to help from a self-care standpoint, how we can help overcome the stigma uh, uh, and help others uh, as well. So we're gonna be capturing it from a visual uh, note-taking standpoint, uh, and then we'll put out a blueprint that comes from this conversation later. So, so let's, let's just, you know, level set on where we are right now. So just- Are you, coming, last, up late? Are you coming up later or something? Is, is Michael? What's that? Is he gonna come sit here? Or no? He is. He's oh. gonna come up uh, after this part. Oh my bad. Yep. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. So obviously, so, so obviously, Zeno did not brief you. Where's Zeno at? Come on. He's over there. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so so listen. So when when we look at where we are in the country, two mass shootings at the beginning of this month, claiming 30, 31 lives. Uh, 255 mass shootings, uh, you know, as of August 5th uh, this year, which is crazy. You go on your news feed, you're seeing deep, uh, deported uh, families and kids crying, um, mass incarceration at an all-time high. So my, my question first to Dr. Jess, you know, what kind of impact do you think this is having on our country as a whole, and uh, specifically people of color? Yeah, I mean, I think it just, for, especially for people of color, it's just bringing up a lot of those same feelings that come from the trauma that we are all very well um, exposed to, and we have a very long history of that. I think uh, with these mass shootings, it really creates this sort of global and universal feeling of, of not feeling safe. 
right, in places where you should feel safe, in places that we traditionally have been safe in general. So I think for a lot of people, we're going to see a lot more anxiety, um, depression, and it's going to be important to really start to have conversations so that we can all uh, be sure that we are not alone in what we're feeling. Absolutely. I mean, you just saw that in New York where a stampede happened because a, a car backfired and people just assumed that it was a shooting and they, they took that, that stampede, mm -hmm. right? And so that's, that's crazy. Sean, from, from your standpoint, you know, once again, it's not about politics, but when you see, uh, you know, a, a little girl crying, you mm -hmm. know, saying, I need my dad. Like, how does that hit you personally? Well, you said a little girl crying and then what? And she's saying, I need my dad. You know, and she's like, I, so her dad was deported, was caught up in the ice raid, and she's, and she's crying. I mean, how, how do you process that? I think that's the issue that's been going on with this country for so long. And I think that as far as leadership goes, uh, it's impossible to, you know, say how to go about that. I don't know the way to fix that the best way, but I do know that it's very wrong to separate a kid from their parent. You know, I feel like, you, you know, your parents are your protectors, especially at that age. They're more than that. They're like saints, you know what I'm saying? And they would do anything for you. So you knowing that they would do anything for you and then somebody literally ripping you apart from them. I mean, it's like detaching your brain and your heart. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, it's like detaching one, uh, something you can't live without from your, from your body. So I think it's completely wrong. I think it's something that needs to be um, handled and thought about 24-7. And I think that, you know, God bless all the families. God bless everybody who has to go through that because that is traumatized and that is something that they're going to have to live with for the rest of their lives. Even if their parents come back in a couple months, you know what I'm saying? They'll never forget that. And that, that pain will transfer to something else. Mm -hmm. It'll transfer to a relationship. It'll transfer to how they interact with people, it'll transfer to their mentality of um, how they deal with any occurrence that comes to them. You know, it could be a, it could have been a, say, I don't know what person it was, it could have been a black man, a white man who took uh, this little girl's dad away, right? She could treat black men or white men, depending on whatever it is, a, a different way for the rest of her life based off of that occurrence. And that's something that has to be thought about for sure. And, and how, how do you process it? You know, because last year we had a conversation, I asked you about self-care, and uh, you said self-care is important, and you said, but I don't, I don't necessarily do the best job of that. And it was about a year ago today, right? So since that time, how have you, are you still struggling to find that self-care, to, to find that balance? Uh, and if, if not, what have you done to, to get more balance and, and address that in your life? What I personally have done is just, made sure I took the time out for myself, made sure I took the time out to connect to God and be spiritual, made sure I took the time out to, you know, let people know how I feel, because um, when things get backed up back to back on a schedule, uh, and people, jobs are depending on you, you know, as a, I need an answer for this, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And especially being a, in the entertainment industry, it's such an industry that you're so lucky to be in, right? Like, I know how lucky I am to be from the city of Detroit, to be able to tour worldwide, to be able to, to do what I dreamed of doing since I was eight years old, right? And the mentality of that is always like, oh, you gotta stay on their necks, you gotta stay hot, you can't let up, you gotta keep going, you gotta keep going, you gotta keep going, right? So I always thought that was my first priority, you know, or taking care of my family. I always thought that was my first priority until it literally pushed me over the edge and I was burnt out, you know what I'm saying? And the thing that I loved more than anything in the world was starting to feel like a burden to me. Mm. Making music was starting to feel like a burden. Every little thing was starting to feel like a burden. Spending time with my family, you know what I'm saying? My, my core relationships that I had, everything was just starting to become uh, dangerous to me. And so what I did was I just had to take a step back and put myself as a priority and put myself first. And what that allowed me to do was to just take care of myself. And once I did that, everything else around me started clicking and working way better and music started to become fun again. And I started to talk about and have inspiration in so many different ways. You know, so I, I just want to point out how important it is to take care of yourself, 
You know what I'm saying? I know we always tend to put our families ahead of us, and there are times where you're always gonna have to do that, but sometimes you're gonna have to put yourself first too because you're gonna be the best uh, self and bring your best self to the table always. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so on, on that point, on that point about taking care of yourself, Shaka, so we've had this same conversation as well about putting yourself first. I think you said, um, Oprah, someone told you, you know, it's not, um, it, it's not uh, uh, selfish, right, to, to that. What was it? it was, it's, it's not selfish. So it's not selfish, it's... Uh, Self-love. Self-full. Oh, Self-full, self that's what it was. Self-full. Uh, so, you know, um, first I just want to address actually your first question when you just talked about the collective reaction to mass shootings, right? Yeah. What I, what I recognize is happening right now is America is catching up with the hood. So, the anxiety the country is feeling, this is what our kids have been feeling for decades. And so, what I hope comes out of that is a recognition and acknowledgement that PTSD is a real thing, that it's not something imagined in the hood, and the reason I say that, because how, how you started the conversation off by introducing me, is something that I think is specifically important to this community. Because this is where I'm from, I grew up here, on the east side of Detroit, and I grew up like a lot of the kids that we walked past to stand outside the liquor store, stand outside the gas station. I was one of those kids that felt isolated because I was growing up in an abusive home and I ran away at 14. And when it's six months, I experienced every imaginable horror a kid can experience. It's one of the things we don't think about when we look at black boys, we don't look at them as kids. I was a kid when I was beat nearly to death. I was a kid when I was robbed at gunpoint. At the age of 17, I was a kid when I was shot multiple times. At the age of 19, I was a kid when I shot and tragically ended a man's life because the PTSD that I suffered as a result of being shot hadn't been addressed because our hospitals don't recognize us as kids or humans going through a real experience of processing PTSD on our own. And so what I did is my pistol became my therapy. And instead of crying tears, I cried bullets that deeply impacted our community. And so now when we look and we see people saying, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening in our country. There was this many shootings. But if you watch the Chicago news where 30 people are shot over the weekend, you go out here in the hood where people are shot every day. Period. Uh, these are our realities, right? So culturally, um, we have to address the collective PTSD. And in my personal experience of doing this work, recently I stepped down, I was running an organization that does re-entry work. And I've been doing this work for a long time. I was in the joint for 19 years. I've been home for nine years doing criminal justice work. And what I experienced in my own life was that I was re-traumatizing myself so much by retelling my story, but also being in proximity to people who were still processing their trauma. And what ended up happening for me to make the decision to step down, it was an amazing job. It was great, great access, uh, decent pay, because people don't like to pay people in a nonprofit space, like they don't like to pay teachers, and the people that's actually doing real ass work. Right. Um, but, what I recognized in that, in that experience was that a lot of times we stay in it far longer than we should because we feel guilty. And what it came back to was recognizing that quote, it was actually Iyala Vanzan, and she said, when you take care of yourself first, you're not being selfish, you're being self-full because you're pouring back into yourself. And in order to have the type of impact that we imagine ourselves happen, having, and in order to pour into other people, we have to pour into ourselves first. So I'm still learning that, like it's a hard thing to process, especially as a man, and as a black man, where we're taught emotionally that we can only articulate our anger or a, 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 an emotion that makes us look cool. So it's hard for me to even receive love. And that's something that I had to process um, based on my experience of growing up in the D. So, so what do you mean it's hard for you to re uh, receive love? What, what does that mean? So I have a very complex experience in life. And in order to love somebody, you have to understand them. You have to understand what they've gone through. You have to understand what their triggers are, what their trauma has been. And when you grow up in a household where you're told that you wasn't wanted, you know, and it's something, it's a conversation. As a mentor, I've worked in these schools in the D, 
And I've watched parents come in and degrade and demean their kids in such a manner where these kids don't have a sense of self-worth. I was one of those kids. Like when I looked in the mirror, all I thought about was take your nappy head ass outside and play. It took me years to learn how to love my locks. And my locks was actually a rebellion against that identity of self-hate. And so it's a long process. Like you have to process that trauma because it happened so early in our childhood. Uh. And you know me as a parent, every night I do affirmations with my seven-year-old son. Every night, no matter where I'm at in the country, we FaceTime, by phone, by text, when we're in each other's presence, because I have to prepare him to love himself when the world is telling him that as a black boy, he's unlovable. Dr. Jess, uh, Pediatric Association just came out with a report uh, that's basically backing up scientifically what Shaka is saying is that there's this long lasting impact on our youth with dealing with things like racism, and specifically racism. So a lot of times in our country, we, we argue whether is this person racist, is that racist, et cetera, et cetera. But this report basically says, yes, racism is real. They actually uh, uh, coined a term for it now. And more importantly, it has long-term impacts. Have you seen that in, in your work? And if so, what are some of those long-term impacts? Absolutely. I mean, so racism itself is considered um, a, a, in the five different areas when we look at how society affects our health, racism is one of those, right? So it affects not only your physical health, but it affects your mental health. Um, one of the things that you're sharing, even with talking to your son and doing affirmations every night, it's so important. By the age of nine, children already know how they sort of fit into the world based on their race. We're talking nine years old, right? By 12, it's already finished. They know that if they're black in America, that this is who they are to the rest of the world. So the best thing that you can do is to start to implement cultural identity as early as you can. You should be speaking love and life to your children because that is going to help them to feel more confident, to feel better about themselves so that when the world goes and shows them this is where a black body is supposed to be, they already know that that's the world's poison and that's not really who I am. So it's so important to do that. I was excited when you shared that's what you were doing. Um, and it's also gonna be important to know that racism, it runs deep, right? So you might think uh, that the only racism that really exists is if someone calls you the N word or make, makes it very obvious, but it's deeply, deeply rooted. We even know in medicine that doctors believe, I'm a medical doctor also, I don't believe this, but a lot of medical doctors believe that black people have a higher threshold for pain, right? And that's because of, uh, of, of during slavery, different doctors doing these heinous crimes on, on black bodies that essentially led to this belief that black people can tolerate more pain. It continues, right, in the way that we practice medicine, how we learn. So the, the racism is really, really deeply rooted in our country. Um, obviously, the the best thing that we could do is to dismantle all of it, but that takes time. So I encourage people every day when I see them in my office to practice self-care, to do things like yoga and meditation. That's why I'm so excited for this self-care room. It might sound kind of like, why would I do this? But it's gonna have so many benefits to not only your body, to your mind. We know that people who practice yoga live longer. They have happier lives. This is gonna help you to go inward and remember who you are. So, you know, until we can fix the system, we have to realize that it is affecting our bodies. 20% of black people are more likely to say that they are under more psych severe psychological distress than any other race. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. So Sean, let me ask you this. Obviously, Shaka, Dr. Jester, talking about the importance of parents, um, you know, really helping their, their kids, you know, understand their importance, love themselves, you know, um, being open about any struggles with depression or, or, or whatnot. So before you opened up about your anxiety, about your depression, was there a thought in there? Like I'm doing this for, for you know, the people, I'm doing this for the youth, I'm doing this for everyone out there, or was it just more of a personal therapeutic uh, decision on your part? Because influencers play a big role in our kids' lives. You know, you'll, you'll see a, a four-year-old who can repeat every word to one of your songs, you know, I, but, but they may not be able to repeat the alphabet sometimes, right? And so, yeah. so influencers have such a big role. Mm -hmm. how, how big of a role did that kind of play in your decision? Well, first of all, I'm from, obviously everybody in here is, but I'm from Detroit, right? So 48221. And when you said, that thing about P 
PTSD, you know, and all the things that I saw growing up, right? And PTSD, you know, it's not just something that like war veterans have or, you know, something that traumatic um, happened to you a long time ago and you're still going through it. PTSD is also present traumatic stress Absolutely. disorder. You feel what I'm saying? There's people going through this presently every single day right now. And I wanted to open up about mental health is what we're gonna call it. Because I truthfully feel like communication is the bridge to salvation that God is walking us across. And just like, and just like any bridge, you can't miss out on any steps. So I realized that no matter how many records I sell, if I have the number one song, this or that, what really is my purpose is to inspire and uplift. Because I've never met somebody who was truly successful, ever, that wasn't healthy mentally. And if they weren't, they immediately lost it. And if they were and lost it, they immediately got it right back. They could do it again. I was talking to Jay-Z when I was going through my album recently, and I was talking to him, and one of the things we both said was, it's crazy how kids in school learn all these things. And you know, I'm not trying to be a biologist, but I had to learn biology. I'm not trying to be a chemist, I had to learn chemists. I didn't learn how to deal with anxiety in school. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn how to deal with depression. I didn't learn how to deal with things emotionally. And it has to change. Whether you call it mental health class, whether you call it internal, whatever, whatever it is, it has to be implemented in school because every parent may not have the capacity to, to be Shaka, mm -hmm. to express that to their kids, to give them affirmations, to be able to deal with things. You know what I mean? So to go back to your question, it was the most important thing for me to open up, not just so I could feel better, but so somebody else can relate to it because uh, that's what life is all about. We gotta share our knowledge with each other, right? Mm -hmm. And that point I made about people, you know, being successful, um, like I said, I've never met anybody who was successful that wasn't mentally healthy, which is mm -hmm. mental health, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why, I, that's why I'm opening up about and, it. And what's been the response? What's, what's been the the response that you've gotten since opening up? I haven't been monitoring the response necessarily, but I do know that there are people who come up to me and say, man, thank you for talking about that, bro. Thank you for bringing that up. You know what I mean? Thank you for sharing. Because, you know, one of the things that we do, like we, we're taught is just like, if you, as a black man everywhere in this country, not just Detroit, and probably around the world, as a man, not even just black, as a man, you taught to be tough, suck it up, you a bitch if you crying, what, like, man, you better man up, or he disrespected you, you gotta go retaliate. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Think about all the leaders we lost, you know what I'm saying? All the, the great ones, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Tupac, Biggie, Nipsey, Nipsey Hussle. Yeah, sure. That could have been communicated better, you know? Could have been talked through. Because like I said, I said this before, nothing is worth taking somebody's life. My grandma who passed away, all she did was work for me, for my mom, for me and my brother. You know what I'm saying? Imagine if somebody took my life over retaliating or being tough. They setting back generations of work. You're setting back a whole family. So, I forgot what the actual question was. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I made my point. Yeah. It doesn't matter. That was pretty good. So <laughs> so I that. Um, Shaka, you know, to kind of piggyback on the PTSD conversation and, and what Sean was talking about there, I remember one of the most uh, impactful parts of your story that you shared, uh, and, and I've heard you say before, is after you got shot that first time, they literally bandaged you up, right? Yeah. Gave you some medication and sent you home. There was no one to say, what happened? Are you okay? What are you going through? 
right? So they literally just, just patch you up and threw you back out. And then no wonder your gun became, you know, your therapy to yeah. a certain extent. What can our system do better? You know, what are some practical things our, our system can do better to make sure that a shaka doesn't go out there and, and take his own form of therapy in its hands? Yeah, I, I think that's one of, the, one of the greatest questions that we've been trying to solve for a long time. And again, it goes back to the identity of black bodies and this callousness in which they're dealt with. You know, when you, when you think about young black boys growing up in these communities, oftentimes they're forced to mature at a rate that's not comparable with other races. And we do it ourselves within our own home, where we're like, oh, this little man. Come here, man, man. No, this is the little man of the house. Uh, so we're not allowing them to, the process to be boys. So when they go out into the world, the world doesn't see them as boys or as kids. And one of the things that I, I grapple with, you know, after I got shot, is really looking at the history of my family. Like eight men in my family have been shot. Damn. And a couple of them on multiple occasions. And so what, what, what that told me is that we're not, we're not taking PTSD real when it comes to inner city kids. And fortunately, you know, I, I've, been, I've been blessed to work with incredible people. Uh, my friend Calvin Evans does trauma-informed care. Calvin, who's in the audience, is a brother who served 24 years for a crime he didn't commit. Where's your hand? Where, where's and he was shot. He was shot at the age of 20. Um, and what Calvin, what Calvin does right here in Detroit, he's one of the first people who responds to the young men who get shot. And he goes and talks to them. And he goes and offers them the hug that I didn't get. And he goes and talks to them and say, hey, listen, you can come out on the other side of this. And that you don't have to keep replaying that tape over and over in your head. And the way that PTSD works is you continue to rewind those moments, right? Like, I had to figure this out. I was actually dating a young lady, and she asked me to walk, like, just go on a walk. And I was like, nah, I don't walk. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I drive the big body thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it really wasn't that. What it was that I don't walk because I got shot when I was walking. I don't like being that vulnerable or that exposed. And this is years later, and so I had to process that, right? And now I had a maturity and the knowledge and the skill set to do it. But what about a kid who doesn't? Mm -hmm. um, there's another young man in the audience right now who I, I definitely want y'all to pay attention to, Demetrius Herman. I watched this young brother raise awareness about mental health amongst his peers. It's a brilliant young guy. And he's used every medium possible to communicate that, hey, we have to be able to talk about it. We have to be able to have these conversations. And, and, and now, to me, I think this is the most important conversation in our community. And, and I'll, I'll say this last thing, and I know this is going to be controversial, right? So I grew up in a household where when you didn't do what was said, you got your ass beat. If you didn't do it fast enough, you got your ass beat. If mama was having a bad day, you got your ass beat. And the thing that happens in our community is that we turn that pain into humor. And so we'll sit here and we'll, we'll crack all type of jokes like, yeah, I remember my mama hit me across the head with a stick. I remember she made me go out back and, and grab a switch so she can beat me. And well, you know what I do when I, when I have these conversations with parents? I always ask them this. I say, what if, your, what if your significant other came home and was like, you know what? You didn't clean them dishes up and start whooping your ass with a belt. And was like, go down there and clean them dishes up. Like, how would you react to that? And if you can answer that question, then you'll know that it's not okay to treat your children like that. Mm -hmm. And so, while we're talking about cultural trauma, like we can't talk about cultural trauma without talking about household trauma. Like we can't have that conversation. We can't be real about it. Like you can't, you can't end gun violence until you end the violence that we inflict on our own kids. Like, my son is seven years old. I don't have to raise my hand to my son because I can communicate. And I know how to ask for help when I can't. And that's what we do. we're not doing enough of that in our community, saying, look, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by all this energy that this child has. 
And so we got to stop being like, sit your ass down somewhere. They're kids. Mm -hmm. They're kids, right? I had, a, I had a conversation with a sister who was ready to punish her nephew because he took an iPhone and ran it up under some water after watching a video that said it was waterproof. <laughs> and so her reaction was to punish, right? I said, what if you reframe this, right? Yeah, everybody else laughed, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like, she wants to punish. right, she wants to punish. I said, but what if you reframe this and recognize that he's a scientist getting empirical data? <laughs> Changes how you see things, you know what I mean? So, so for us, if we, can, if we can get to the point where we can have an honest conversation together, and we can talk about that together, you know, as friends, as fathers, as, you know, co-parents, parent, well, Calvin says no more co-parents, as parents, I think we can address the PTSD in our community because we'll understand that we're part of the problem as well, and we can't let ourselves off the hook. Absolutely, absolutely. So before I go to the doctor, so I agree with that, mm -hmm. but I can tell you how frustrating it is. So I have a 13-year-old, <laughs> and she, she always did science experiments in her room, in her bedroom bathroom. So you come in and you have, you know, just a mess. Everyone has a parent. You want to just go off and go nuts. But I remember talking to my wife saying, but how are we going to punish her for being interested in science? You know, right. like, although it, it, was, it was aggravating, but every parent doesn't have that coping skill where they can self-assess and flip it, like you mm. said, to say, all right, how, how do we actually uplift this? She's a scientist, right? Mm. That's a great thing. Mm. Um, so what, what are some, some coping, or what are some strategies parents can take? You know, if there's parents in here, they're frustrated, yeah. what, what are a couple things they can do to, to avoid tearing into that ass? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was a See our reaction? Again. We like, yep. Just saying. Yeah. So I, I think the first thing that you have to realize is that it's never a good time to do anything when you're angry, Absolutely. okay, period. Whether that's your children, your spouse, your partner, whatever. You have to learn how to take a time out for yourself. So if you walk into your child's room and it's in disarray because they are using empirical data to mm -hmm. figure out whatever project, yeah. you, you know, it, it's okay to, to walk in that room Realize you're getting angry, which means now you have to recognize those signs that you're feeling angry, right? Anger isn't just when you're hitting someone. Anger, you start to feel it rise, Absolutely. right? It took me a while, even, you know, even in this work, to realize when I feel angry, my breath gets really sort of shaky, or my, my, my voice gets shaky. I feel heat sort of rising. I notice that I'm trembling. Your body is telling you far beyond the time that you act that you're starting to get to that point. So you need to stop recognize what's happening in your body, and then take a time out. Your child's room is still gonna be a mess, don't worry, right? Go and meet with someone else. It, it, hopefully it's your partner or everybody here has family, friends. Call them up, maybe it's time to vent, let some of that anger off. Come up with a plan of how you can properly help your child understand what the rules are when they are gonna do these experiments, which is don't do it in your room, do it outside, whatever it is, but you don't wanna to act to your point because now you're passing on that intergenerational trauma. We know how to hurt each other because we've been beaten and hurt over and over again. Yeah. So again, just to reiterate so that you guys understand, stop, right? Recognize what's happening in your body so that you can pick up the signs that you're feeling angry and then take a moment and then come back and talk to your child. They can comprehend they understand, and it's okay to not act out that anger in that moment. It's gonna hurt you and them in the long run. Sean, I wanna go back to something you kinda of hit on uh, around barriers and uh, taking time for yourself and you know, being self full and not self -lit. How do you make sure that you don't cross a line of being self full to the point where you actually start inflicting uh, pain on others, right? And so what I mean by that is I know myself, and we've talked about this, every, everyone who's high performing has to figure out how to balance, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to figure out, okay, if me pulling back at this point, is this impacting my kids, mm -hmm. right? So yes, I'm, I'm protecting myself at this point, mm -hmm. but now because I'm being self fold am I actually inflicting long-term pain uh, on my family, on my friends, on my business, you know, What's the balance that, that you see in that? I think the, one of the biggest keys to balance is intuition and realizing um, what matters to you, realizing how you're affecting the people around you that love you and care for you, 
But I really do feel like intuition is necessary when it comes to balance. You know, you can't do, emotions are things you can't measure with data. You know what I'm saying? You can't measure, okay, I'm gonna spend this amount of time here, two hours here, <laughs> four hours here, and three hours with my family, and then I'm gonna sleep six and a half hours, not eight hours tonight because I slept nine hours. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like intuition is the key to um, obtaining true balance, listening to your heart, listening to yourself. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's one, of, that's one of the ways that I uh, practice balance. And it's a, it's a, every day is different, you know? Well, and I, I think absolutely. And I think it also goes to communication, right, as well, as being able to communicate, hey, you know what, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. Mm -hmm. and, and so I need to hold back, I need to take a day for myself. And then I also think being authentic. Do I really need that day, or am I using this as a as, know, an, excuse. as an excuse to? Yeah, there are times where like I feel like that was what hindered me for so many years uh, in my personal development. As I used to just be, you know, didn't ever want to speak up because I didn't want to seem soft or I didn't want to seem, you know, like I couldn't handle the workload. But there are times where I really did need a little more personal time, and I didn't speak up because. You know, I'm thinking like, oh, I might disappoint this person. I might let this person down. There's people, you know, my mom, my dad, my homie, my, you know, I employ a lot of the people I came up with. I don't want to let them down. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to let my managers down. I don't want, you know, and they're asking for all these things. So I think that when you just communicate to them and let them know how you're feeling and say, hey, I really, really need this time for myself. I don't think there's anybody who doesn't respect that, and if they don't respect that, then they don't belong to be around you or in your circle. Really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, let's, let's start with you, and then we'll work, work our way down this way. Just give us um, your self-care schedule for the day, right? What, what are some of the, the things that you do to stay balanced, to process what's going on? Um, what, what's your schedule like? Well, first of all, I journal every single day. I have a journal. Um, that I write my affirmations in <laughs> daily. I start my affirmations with a capital I am because I feel like that is the most uh, important and powerful way to activate my affirmations. Um, after I'm done with my affirmations, I sign it at the end because I feel like that's how kings used to do back in the day. They used to sign their laws. And to me, my affirmations are laws, so I sign it and I say, it is done. And I write it with a gold pen. This is, um, I learned this from Marie Diamond. And I write it with a gold pen and I treat it like it's a sword. Uh, after that, I meditate. I have a personal meditation where I connect, you know, with myself, the center of the earth, my higher self, you know, where I see myself, where I activate uh, me being in control. I activate, uh, love that people have for me and I have for people. And I activate the power of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I forgive myself for having grudges. I forgive myself for having grudges towards other people, grudges towards myself. Mm -hmm. I, um, after that, I, uh, I sit there for a second and I immediately feel way better than I did, even if I was already feeling good. And after that, I go out and I do whatever I put on my personal affirmations. A lot of times my affirmations are for that day. Sometimes they're for that moment in time, like maybe that month. Sometimes they're long term. Uh, I have a vision board that I look at, that I complete it. And a lot of my old vision boards, I've seen a lot of it manifest. And I do, it's what I believe in. You know what I mean? I'm not embarrassed to say any of that. And then I realized that you gotta have fun, so I just go make sure anything I do is fun, you know? I, one of the things that I was able to accomplish uh, when I was with my spiritual advisor is that uh, my life story, right? So I apply my life story to everything that I do. And um, ever since I've been doing that, life for me has just been so much more enjoyable. You know what I mean? And my, what do you mean by life story? Well, my life story is something that 
you know, uh, it's not about, I used to always think about life being the things that I wanted to manifest, and that was my whole purpose in life, right? Like, I want this, I want this car, I want that, 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 all, the, all this material stuff. But I realized that that's not really your purpose, those are just desires, you know what I'm saying? So, I just imagine that I have no desires. Everything that I want is already done, right? So then, so then I say, well, what is your purpose in life? You know, what, is your, what are your ancestors gonna be proud of? What are your you know, future generations gonna remember you for, right? So I wrote down a life story that was like 15, 20 pages of all the things that I wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? So I had to consolidate those like 20 pages into three lines. Then I was like, okay, I'm gonna apply these three lines to everything that I do in life, right? So this is extremely personal, but you ask and hopefully it'll inspire other people because everybody has their own life story, right? So mine is I am happy and fun, I am inspirational, and I am the best, right? But what that means is that um, anything that I do needs to be happy and fun. Any song I make, any video I shoot, I need to have fun. Is it gonna, be, is it gonna make other people happy? Is it gonna lift them up? You know what I'm saying? Is this inspirational to me? Is this gonna inspire somebody else? Is this the best that I can be? Is this the best I can do? Is this gonna make somebody feel their best? You know what I'm saying? So I've, I've been applying that just to every opportunity that comes my way. Like, for example, I was a little overwhelmed, but Lena Waithe approached me to do a TV show, right? And I love film, I love TV, I love watching TV, I love like, you know, I did Shakespeare plays when I was younger. And Maybe I would have looked at my schedule a few years ago and be like, man, I got, I'm trying to finish this album. I got too much going on. But instead, I asked myself, man, is this going to make me happy? Is it going to be fun? Probably. <laughs> is it going to be inspirational to be on a set with Lena Waithe? Yeah, it probably will be inspirational for me. Is it going to be the best? Yeah, I'm going to do my best. At least I think it's going to be the best. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. She's one of the best, you know? So I, I apply that to every opportunity that comes my way. And just truthfully, it has made my life so much more enjoyable, so much more pleasurable. And as a black man, nobody ever taught me these type of things. So that's why I think me opening up about it, you know, maybe, this, maybe my process isn't the right process for you, but at least you can find a similar process. And as long as it works for you, as long as it makes you feel better, then that's how you know it's working. You know, you don't ever have to question your faith. You can always tell by your emotions, because those are indicators that the universe built inside of us to tell us that, hey, what you're doing is right. You're on the right track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, first of all, thank you. Mm -hmm. Like, it really means a lot to hear that from another brother. Um, and I just deeply appreciate it. One of, the, one of the things that I do to start my day is I find three random things to be thankful for. And I'm super intentional about them, about them not being like the obvious, right? Um, so it's like, oh, I'm thankful I got socks that match. Um, I got toothpaste, and it's at least one squig of orange juice left. Um, and, I, and I do that very intentionally because it's part of like a mindfulness approach to life where I'm acutely aware of what I'm experiencing, when I'm experiencing it, how I'm experiencing it, but it also deepens the sense of gratitude I have for the fact that I have a new shot at life. Um, mm. When I was in prison, I never thought I was, they actually told me I was never getting out. And so I'm, I'm mindful of that. Uh, my friends are currently in prison now, like my friends' friends, mm. you know? And I, and I say that very intentionally because with mass incarceration being what it is, it's so many of our people who are locked away who everybody's forgot about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so on every scale of my life, I'm always thinking about being appreciative of the things that I know they would enjoy. Um, the other thing is I'm very conscious about just how I spend my time, who I spend my time with. And in, in a world of, of navigating life as a single man, um, one of my new mantras is, I'm not going to date your trauma. Yeah. Uh, um, and so, wow. You know, how, you, know, you know how women be hitting you with the, what's up, what's up, astrology sign? I'll be like, what therapist do you go to? Like, let's talk about that shit, like real talk. Like, um, but, 
<laughs> That's just real talk, bro. Like, I mean, but I think it's something that we don't we don't discuss enough, even in the dating world, right? We don't talk about, you know, dating somebody who has trauma from previous relationships, uh, who has other life traumas and things that they're going through, and, and, and may not feel comfortable having real deep conversation, meaningful conversation. You better say that. Man. So, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I'm super intentional about the conversation I have with anybody it has to be meaningful. It has to be purposeful. Uh, I have a checklist of kind of like the way I navigate. So Sean talked about earlier of like understanding like, is this leading you to your happiness and, and the sense of fulfillment? And to me, I'm, my, my metric is, is this fulfilling to me? Mm. Does it fulfill my purpose? Does it make me fulfill uh, uh, meaningful in what I do? And I had to do that because I get invited to do all these panels and you, everybody wants you to mentor and everybody wants you to fix all the things, right? And I love it, like I love being able to pour into my people, right? But there's times when I have to measure what is the logistics behind that? What is the relationship dynamic behind that? Uh, does this really help me manifest my purpose in a meaningful way, but also does it honor the little boy that's still inside of me? Uh, because we don't take care of that kid that's inside of all of us. One of the ways that I engage in conflict is I have to, when I, when I, when I get into a, any type of disagreement, I start with, if I can see the child in that person, then I know that this is fixable. Like it's fixable, and so those are the ways that I kind of measure how I engage people. And trust me, I get pissed off all the time. I'm an entrepreneur, you know how that goes. Contracts ain't right and people not, you know, things aren't moving as fast as you want them to, to move. Mm -hmm. But understanding that sometimes that's the little boy in me fighting to get that immediate gratification. And so I have to acknowledge that and not be insensitive to it. Or, you know, to Sean's point, I feel soft about saying, you know what, this doesn't feel comfortable today. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel in the best of moods today. And I want to acknowledge like what that is, process that out of my system. Um, and then finally, my <laughs> last self-care is I drink really amazing tequila. <laughs> it's fucking fantastic, right? <laughs> what I do out in these streets, just yeah. in case I, like ama I say amazing, so that means Clean. not 1800, like, you know. I mean, I will do some shots if I'm forced to, right. but like really good, like that I have to like, I mean, I even love to like understand like the plants and which region and all that, so. Yeah, really good tequila. <laughs> tequila, yeah, I feel that, I feel you. Yeah, it's good tequila. That's real important. Right on that note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shots. <laughs> Shots popping. Shots. But I, I also have to share the sentiments that you, you share with Sean. Also, I want to share them with you. It's, um, it's really great to hear black men, men, sharing this way. I'm so inspired, and I'm, I'm inspired. <laughs> inspiring me to step my self-care up, okay? So I think, you know, I want to, I definitely want to speak to, I know there are people in the room who may be feeling like, oh, I got a lot of work to do, and, and we've got some examples, certainly, to hear on how we can be more intentional. Um, I can say for me, you know, I, as a psychiatrist, I, I primarily do therapy, and so I'm taking in a lot of stories, a lot of emotions. I'm holding that emotion for people when they're breaking down. I'm, you know, being the person in the room to not cry with you, even though, you know, that can be okay, but most therapists should not be crying back with you. So I'm in my own therapy, and I found that that was probably one of the hardest things to do as a black woman, as a psychiatrist, is to say, you know what, I'm going to go and, and talk to someone through my life, right? Because I'm also a product of intergenerational trauma. I'm also living under the same stressful environment, you know, as all of us here in the room live under, even though I can say, oh, I'm a doctor, I have this. I'm still under the same um, limitations that we all have, just the way the society is currently set up. So I'm in my own therapy. I, I go every single week. Um, and, and that is my time to be intentional about what I'm going through, the past, and just the space to really honor what I'm feeling. Um, and, and learn how to work through challenges in my own life. Mm. On a day-to-day, -day, I mean, I, you know, my husband's here, my family is here. I want y'all to say hey, this y'all moment to shine. Okay. Hey, by the way, this is an all Detroit panel. It is. What up, though? This is the What Up Doe panel. It is. It is. Dope panel. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm, I'm very intentional about, like, who I engage with. Um, you know, I, I love what you're talking about, about being, you know, just 
the intentional way that we should engage in life. And, and mindfulness is something that I try to do every single day. If I'm eating a piece of fruit, I slow down and I just take that fruit in. And, and that's something that you can all do. In this moment, you can even practice mindfulness. You can pay attention to the temperature, to the sound of the person next to you as they breathe. That's going to give you more gratitude. I try to do that every single day. There's a quiet moment in my apartment when I wake up. And I just take it in, right? And, and I use that as a way to really just be grateful for the fact that I'm here and that I have another opportunity to show up and help other people and also be helped along the way. So, you know, I think I would like to encourage people to know that self-care is not just getting your nails done, getting your hair done, getting the lashes done, or man, going to the gym. The gym is very important. But that is, good. all that is good. It is, it is. <laughs> I co that. I co but, <laughs> but I think we forget that that isn't doing the inner work. The self-care is really when you slow down and you learn who that is inside, and you learn what it's going to keep you sort of going, what's going to keep you feeling positive, what's going to keep you feeling excited that you show up every single day so you can still do those other things that we all practice. My nails are done. Absolutely. Too. Yeah, right. Uh, but, you know, that's sort of what I do. Try to be intentional. I mean, you're from Detroit, so of course you're going, you know, I mean, we know how to keep our rap. looks right. You know, we clean cut, we're from Detroit, we crispy all the, all the time, you know what I'm saying? We know how to dress. What we do. You know, we know how to take care of ourselves in that way. But like you said, mindfulness, that's something that I have to practice myself because it's so hard to get thrown off and, you know, forget that you're in the moment. Yeah. I mean, that's probably one of the, it, it truly takes talent to live in the moment. You know what I'm saying? That's something that, I don't, especially now that we on social media, especially now that we looking at moments that just passed and everybody moments and figuring out what's the next moment we gonna post or what's the next moment they gonna post or all these type of things, you know what I'm saying? How many people liked it. How many people liked it. And you know, to me what's crazy is that I'm truthfully, the internet helped made me and get my me message out and it has so many great qualities to it. So I never would, would bash it. But it's just crazy to me that the like button on Instagram is a heart. So as a kid, when they when they look at that, you know what I'm saying? Especially, you know, from see where I'm from, it's like we saw the internet come about really. You know what I'm saying? We saw like when Instagram was a new thing. We remember that. But this kid's coming up now that's joining Instagram, they 10, 13, 14, they don't know nothing. They don't know life before that. They got their phone when they was 10 years old, you know what I'm saying? And it's a smartphone. Right, so when you go on Instagram and you post a picture of yourself and it's a heart, and it's just like you attaching that to your heart for real. Mm -hmm. And so that's affecting your mood. That's why it's like, oh, I didn't get as many likes on this one, or I didn't do that. And it's just like, I just want people to know that that heart under that picture ain't your real heart, you know what I'm saying? And to separate that. Right. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing right or wrong, right? Because that's being judgmental. And who are we to judge? Like, only God is the only one supposed to judge. We put all this judgment on, on each other when it's just like, you know, people will judge you before they love you. People will judge you before they help you. You know what I'm saying? And um, I don't know when that, when that changed, you know? I don't know when that happened. I don't know when it was cool to just be like, that shit whack. <laughs> you weak. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just so popular, though. I think it's like because people get, people laugh at that's funny. You know, it gets more attention like that. Mm -hmm. And people who do that, sometimes they don't even realize what they're doing. But when you realize that you live in a world where what goes around comes around, and it's a world that's based on energy, you should really pay attention to the energy you're giving off, even if it's through your phone, if it's through your expression, because it's going to come back to you in a way. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know anybody who is truly like a natural hater that doesn't have hate in their life. You know what I'm saying? I don't know that. And I just feel like, well, if you know that you live in a world where you get, you get what you give, why wouldn't you just show love or try and help? Because that's what you want want back. You know what I'm saying? That's why, you know, we all individuals. I just, I really wish that people would embrace that more. We're getting desensitized, for one. Two, we started this dialogue about political correctness. I don't want to be political correct. It's too political correct. And that opened the door for us to basically be like, we, we don't have to care about one another. And now we're seeing all that manifestation you know, come home to roost. And I think that's part of the problem. Um, so we have to fix that. We have to go back 
and draw a line between political correctness and, and showing love for someone else and making sure that that's how we're treating each other. It's nothing wrong with showing love for each other, so we gotta go back to that. So I go, yeah. Yeah, I just, I mean, uh, something earlier on you said about the, the impact of racism on our mental health. Uh. Like the deep rooted way that haterism shows up is a manifestation of deep rooted insecurities that come from being subjected to people with this racial superiority complex. And we're constantly trying to validate ourselves through systems that actually was designed to destroy us and demean us and degrade us. Um, and so, and, that, and that's real talk. Like when you, when, you, when, you, when you think about the conversation that's happened in the world where you started at, right, with, with people being deported, you know, the president going to these rants. And it, it's always interesting to me the way that we react to the racial part of it, right? And what that tells me is that that's a deep part of us that we haven't healed. Even the trauma in the household, that's deep rooted from the beatings that was administered to our ancestors when they were enslaved. And so until we uproot that reality and we grapple with that, uh, first we gotta recognize our ancestors weren't slaves. They were people who were enslaved. This is a very different thing. Uh, these were human beings who were subjected to somebody else's greed and selfishness and, and things of that nature. And so once we can get to a real identity and recognize these were people, these were grandmothers, these were brothers, these were sisters, these were aunts, then you can start uprooting the emotional uh, angst that we have around this racial identity crisis that goes on in our community. It's 2019 and we're still dealing with light skin versus dark skin. You know what I'm saying? Like that's deep rooted in our culture because the self-hatred is deep rooted in our experience with our ancestors being enslaved. And we just have to deal with that. Like we gotta have a real conversation. Not the, not the cute Black History Month ones that work for other people. Like it's real talk, right? Like I, I mean, I'm sure all of us know Rosa Parks, Dr. Martin Luther King, and, I, and that's, those are beautiful ancestors who contributed mightily to where we're at, right? But we also need to know Master Musa. We also need to know Imhotep. We also need to know Shaka. We need to know the ancestors that built civilization the way that it exists now. Like all the blueprints of what civilization is, I came from our ancestors, that's encoded in our DNA. We gotta uproot that, real talk. So I think, I think that's how we solve a lot of the haterism because one thing I know for sure is if you see yourself as the king, as a king, you can't help but see the king and other brothers you encounter and the queen and the sister, period. So when I greet y'all and I say, what's up queen? I ain't trying to just get on, I mean it because I know I'm a king, period. You know what I mean? Period. 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 So last, here's my last question uh, before we bring up Dr. Dyson. He's gonna kind of help us wrap our, our arms around this, this conversation and then we're gonna open it up for, uh, for Q&A. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to use you guys as my therapist, all right? So it's <laughs> something I've been struggling with that I, I wanna get your take on it, all right? So I love to debate. I love having conversations about politics, about race, you know, you name it, I love it, right? Um, but recently, I've come to the, to the realization that it doesn't even make sense anymore. It doesn't even, you know, you can have a conversation with someone and the facts can be so clear that, but yet they still deny it. Uh -huh. It shouldn't be deniable. Uh -huh. But what I've been struggling with is saying, if I don't have these conversations about race, if I don't have these conversations, am I cutting off an opportunity to help someone. But on the flip side, by going into this, I'll get worked up for days over a conversation. I had a conversation with a neighbor who's African American who, who refused to, to admit that the president is racist. <laughs> Damn near that there is racism, uh, right? Uh. And so, and I was worked up for <coughs> days behind that. So, so help me as my therapist, <laughs> my what up though therapist uh, today. Do I continue those conversations? Or do I just cut them off to preserve, you know, my, my self-care? Well, at least you spoke up. I feel like if you didn't speak up, you would be like feeling even worse, right? That's what I struggle with. Right? Sometimes you just gotta say your piece and then just know that you said your piece and that, you know, you can't really change how people think. They have to change how they think. This, you know, you can do all the things in the world to try and influence somebody, but it may work, it may not. You may, they may see what you're saying, they may not, but that ain't got nothing to do with you, really. You know, it's kind of like. So you say cut them off. I don't say cut them off. I just say, 
Accept that they think that that's fine. Accept that they think that he's not racist. You know, you have to accept that too because then at that point you're being judgmental to them. You're being like, you're wrong. You're yeah. messed up for thinking it is, right? Even if factually they may be wrong, it's just like you have to respect what somebody thinks because at least they're thinking, at least they're trying, at least they have an opinion. At least he's not like, well, I don't even look at politics. I don't even care who's president. It doesn't even matter to me, you know? At least he has it, even if it's on a different side of you. You know, you just have to respect people as individuals first and foremost. Mm -hmm. To me, I don't know to me though. Yeah. 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 So my, my process is always asking myself, how much of this is my ego? Mm -hmm. And I do, it, I do it as a parent first, right? They had to go in like that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was gonna say ego, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to do you like that. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. No, but I, I, I really started asking myself that question in the process of parenting. I read this parenting book, um, and it was really a powerful parenting book. And it was just basically saying most of our anxiety or frustrations with our children is really about our ego, right? So whenever I've engaged with my son in a way where I feel myself being worked up. I'm like, is this really my ego? Because I really want him to do what I say. And so what that did is it actually slowed down how I engaged him, right? So it's like, yo, put your shoes on, or go put those, you know, go put those shoes on. And he might come out with two different shoes. And I literally have to ask myself, how much of that is rooted in what people are gonna think about me as a parent versus what makes him happy as a child? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, the answer to my ego is always in between that, right? And it's like, you know what? I ain't got to wear them joints. He going to be rocking them, you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and so the same thing happens in conversation where I think about what are my intentions of having this conversation? Mm -hmm. And if, if my intentions aren't pure, then I have to ask, what does this feed in my ego? Like, I'm a beast at, you know, uh, debating, right? I, I study philosophy, so I love the engagement. Um, and sometimes it is my ego. Sometimes I just want to verbally whoop some ass, you know? It's just like, <laughs> want to get a few thoughts off, right? Um, but what I, what, I, what I realized recently is, and you know, because I write, I write on Medium. In case y'all didn't know, I am a writer, so get that book, Write My Wrongs. And I'm also a hustler, so I want to make sure y'all get that. Um, but as a, as a writer, I'm constantly kind of playing around with, with, with like thought leadership, right? So for example, when Kanye, was going through a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. And people were like, oh, we're just gonna cancel Kanye. And to me, I was like, okay, intellectually, I wanna challenge that. I wanna challenge that idea, mm -hmm. because I think it's important enough conversation for us to have, and I'm thinking I'm the right person to have a conversation, but also gotta understand how much of this is like, can be damaging, because the backlash can come so swift, right? And the reason I thought that was important, because we don't give celebrities permission to be human. And so that was the basis of, of the argument. Um, but then there's other conversations where I'm like, okay, this is not gonna be mentally healthy for me, right? So the current one is Jay-Z and the NFL. And I have a bunch of thoughts, and I'm, I, I know I can articulate them in a very real way, but emotionally what that makes me feel, because how much work I'm gonna have to put into that argument to get people to see what I, what I see personally, is not worth the emotional toll. And so at that point I just, lean back and check my ego and say, you know what, your ego wanna, you know, go in, mm -hmm. but for my mental health, my emotional well-being, I'm like, you know what, I'm not gonna write that piece, so. So, Dr. Jess, is there or anything you wanna anything add, to or add? pretty much we know I'm cocky, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anything you wanna add to that? Or? I mean, I think it's just important never to lose your voice. We, we all have to realize how powerful it is to speak up. Um, mm -hmm. Action, you know, and I think to your point, if you're having a conversation with someone and you know right away it's going to make you upset or it's not going anywhere, practice self-care, set that boundary. All right, we can agree to disagree mm -hmm. and call it a day, but never lose your voice. Don't stop talking about what you need to talk about. Definitely don't stop doing the action because mm -hmm. we're here in this space because of all the work you guys are doing. So keep speaking up, everybody in the room. Speak up, always. And, he's, and that's still your neighbor. That's still your neighbor. Still yeah. Still your neighbor at the end of the day. It's still your neighbor. Oh, Period. he's moving. He's moving. Yeah. <laughs> he is my neighbor. I love him. That is so. right. Um, so no, that's 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 good. I appreciate you guys. So so listen, you guys, give it up for the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.